We are back once again with the number 5 best and worst performing animated movie continuation of an animated TV series. We're at the halfway point, so let's see what we have so far. The worst performing. Number 10, Powerpuff Girls the movie. Number 9, The Chipmunk Adventure. Number 8, My Little Pony the movie. Number 7, Transformers the movie. And number 6, Rainbow Bright and the Star Stealer. Number 10, The Rugrats Go Wild. Number 9, The Wild Thornberry Movie. Number 8, A Goofy Movie. Number 7, South Park, Bigger, Longer, and Uncut. And number 6, The SpongeBob SquarePants Movie. And now, let's get to number 5. And the number 5 worst performing is... Batman, Mask of the Phantasm. You know... I teased that this was coming. I was going to be all dramatic and everything. But even then, I don't think it would do this movie justice. Now this was the only movie based off of the Batman the Animated Series that made it into theaters. It's the only movie. And it could possibly be the best Batman movie to make it into theaters. It opens with haunting music with a choir singing the opening of the Adventures of Batman and Robin theme. The animation is spectacular. The dark deco style they came out with for the backgrounds are breathtaking. We'll get to the character animation in a little bit. This movie has my favorite rendition of Alfred Pennyworth in it. I keep wanting to say Alfred Pennywise. Curse you it! That dry wit and one-liners that come out of this man's mouth is gold. We have flashbacks that are fascinating. Looking into Bruce's past, looking at the love he once had and then lost is quite a brilliant move because it gives us a little more insight into these characters. And then we have Bruce slowly becoming Batman. I swear, the current Gotham season copied some of these ideas. When we get to the Phantasm itself, the twists and turns of this characters, making guesses in the final reveal. It's all great! And the murders. It was almost like watching Jason Voorhees chasing down these people. And the murder in the cemetery with the headstone? Jason would be proud of that. We also get raw emotion from Bruce. Conflicted, a Bruce where his plans are up in the air because of a woman. You feel for him. And you feel bad for him when you find out his inevitable loss. And we finally get to the Joker. They say that Mark Hamill is the best Joker, but that is only partially true. This version of Mr. J is made of a lot of things. All of them shine in this movie. The writing for the Joker is amazing. You are at the edge of your seat one moment and then laughing the next. The animation for the Joker is great too, because... He's a clown. And as dangerous as he is, he still acts the clown. And that is something that is very hard to transition over to live action. And of course we do have Mark Hamill's portrayal. Nobody who's played the Joker has made me laugh so hard and then utterly terrified in the same scene. The writing, the acting, the animation all make this version of the Joker one of the best, if not the best. And now it is time for a rant. The original Batman the Animated Series was a series that kept you on the edge of your seat. The animation was beautiful. The characters expressed a range of emotions through the animation which had the best expressions of fear when a criminal faces the Batman for the first time. Batman was Batman. But he also had compassion, had doubts, but could also laugh, cry, and be relatable. Fast forward to 2017, and all of that is gone. You know, I was looking forward to Batman and Harley Quinn because it was set in the animated series universe. No, correction. It's set in the DC animated universe. A universe that feels like its own separate thing from the animated series. This is the universe where Batman has a stick up his ass and is rather cocky. Gone are the days of I Am The Night, where Bruce questions himself after Gordon gets shot. Gone is the film war atmosphere that made the series. Gone are the trench coats in the class. Gone is the darkness. Because now we have fart jokes and campiness 
and making fun of Booster Gold and a plan to kill everyone on the planet and a phoned in ending. My word, the series is 25 years older. Most of the original fan base is now in their 30s. We kinda don't like stuff like this anymore. They say that Batman and Harley Quinn is supposed to be a more mature Batman movie. But seriously, The Mask of the Phantasm is more mature than this. Why? Why can't we have a movie that is in the original animated series style again? No callbacks to Justice League or Superman the Animated Series. Just let Batman be the detective he was in 1992. Don't get me wrong, I like Justice League and Superman and the other DC Universe shows, but Batman the Animated Series style is only unique to that series. Before it got all blocky and pointy on Kids WB. Now if you want to see a series or movie that grows up with his audience done well, then I would check out Digimon Adventure Try. Getting back to Mask of the Phantasm. Sorry, I went on a little tangent there. From the mystery to the internal struggles to detective work to the Joker, this is what made Batman Batman. As for why it failed, big surprise, the lack of advertising is to blame. It came out December 22nd, 1993, around Christmas time. It was up against Tombstone, Philadelphia, Grumpy Old Men, Wayne's World 2, and The Pelican Brief. Not really anything major. Well, not until they were nominated for Oscars anyway. Maybe because the series was still on television at the time, a lot of people didn't give it much thought. Also, action cartoons don't really do that well in theaters. Unless you're Pixar. <sighs> yeah, unless you're Pixar. <laughs> I didn't see this coming. I didn't count on being happy. It's Toonamp Trivia time! Due to my rules, anime films are not included on this list. However, do you know what the top 10 performing anime theatrical films released in the United States based off of an anime series are? Find out after this. Don't touch me, old man. I don't know where you've been. <laughs> Honorable mention, Jetsons, the movie. So it's been a while since I've seen this movie, so I've forgotten what it was all about. I guess I'll start with the animation. It's classic Hanna-Barbera, which I don't mind. There are improvements, mostly the backgrounds and character animations. It's also nice to see some computer animated buildings that work well with the movie. The Jetsons Art Deco style works with early computer animations. It doesn't look out of place. Uh, like the 90s Spider-Man series. I've always been fascinated with cartoons about the future. It's fun seeing gadgets and futuristic technology, wondering if that's what we will have when we grow older. One of my favorite cartoons that look into this is the Looney Tunes Dog Gone Modern, where two dogs explore a futuristic model home out of curiosity, only to find that the future gadgetry is a little too much for them to handle. So that's what I like about Jetsons. The futuristic gadgets. And let's get this out of the way. Judy Jetson is not in this movie. But isn't that her on screen? It looks like her, but no. That is a celebrity trying and failing to be Judy Jetson. I mean, it's either the script or the acting, but Tiffany does not sound or act like Judy Jetson. Well, at least not the Judy Jetson from the show. By the way, it's both. Look, I know the point of having a celebrity is to attract a certain market, but I don't think it works when you give a loyal voice actress like Janet Waldo the boot from a movie. After she recorded her lines! Because of this, the film's acting director requested her name to be removed from the film. This acting director is Andrea Romano! And I'm gonna be honest, I didn't know who Tiffany was when this movie came out. I still don't. I had to Google the thing. I think this movie is the only time I ever heard her songs. They're... Okay. They're not great. They're okay. Unfortunately, some of the Jetsons cast never got to see the finished product of the film. A lot of the cast was over 65. 
George O'Hanlon, the voice of George Jetson, passed away from a stroke right after recording some of his lines. And Mel Blanc, the voice of Mr. Spacely, passed away from his battle with emphysema and coronary artery disease during production. It is documented that Mel was a smoker. It makes me wonder if his voice would have sounded more closely like it was back in the golden age of cartoons if he didn't smoke. So back to the movie. This movie is infuriating to sit through. It wouldn't be so bad if it was straightforward and focused on George and his new job. But no. We have to deal with Judy's forced shallow teenage crap. You do know that Rockstar is only asking you out on a date to... Hold on. 16 years old? Play darts. That's right, he's asking you out only to play darts. Then he'll move on to play darts with some other girl. How old is Cosmic Cosmo anyway? Should we be concerned that he wants to play darts with teenagers? Maybe he's not so sinister that he wants to play darts with Judy. And this is only a date. But if I were Judy's parents, I still would be a little concerned that a rock star is trying to date my 16-year-old girl. Because... He's a boy! Anyway, Judy's nonsense is just her whining about being broken hearted by a boy who asked you out on a date one time and you blew off that date, so he moved on. Boy, we really needed a song about that. I swear a fourth of this movie is just Tiffany singing. There's also the plot where Elroy feels like his dad is not spending enough time with him. But... That doesn't go anywhere. Even when Jane brings it up, it's quickly thrown to the side. The main plot is George being promoted to vice president and being shipped off to an asteroid to oversee the new Sprocket factory, a factory that is plagued by sabotage. We soon find out that the saboteurs are Ewoks. Yeah, I know that joke is too easy. But I don't have anything really to compare it to other than Gizmo from Gremlins. Apparently, the factory is destroying the Ewoks' home. Okay, I know they're not Ewoks. They're called Grungles. It's just easier to call them Ewoks. So basically, get rid of the Judy nonsense, and you end up with an environmental cartoon. Because those are always good. At least Miyazaki tends to be a little bit vague about his environmental messages. But... We not only talk about environmental issues, but we also get a quote from Judy. Pulling also this planet is about different life forms working together out of her ass. It's like Tiffany wanted to say some important message and they let her say it. It has no context to the story, mind you. Well, maybe a little bit, I guess, trying to work together with the Ewoks, but it's... It still came out of her ass. I mean, it was just pointless. Movie, please stick to one message. So far, we've got like three. And since it's all over the place anyway, let's add this message to the mix. Help control the pet population. Have your pets pay their neuter. Uh -oh. In the end, it's nice not to see a big corporation being taken down when something gets in its way. Clearly, Spacely was in the wrong, and he kind of knew about the living creatures but he chalked it up to urban myth. But it's still kind of nice to see him not completely go down in flames. So the Ewoks and Spacely Sprockets pretty much compromise with each other. And we find out that they both can benefit from each other. If anything, George Jetson's best asset to Spacely is negotiations, not button pushing. I don't think either one noticed it because George got a demotion even though he helped make the factory make a profit with his ideas? Boy, I sure hope Spacely's competition doesn't hear about what George did for Spacely. In the end, the Jetsons return to their old lives. We see them returning to Earth while being played out by a rap song. This is where I turned it off to avoid throwing things at my television. I like my television. I can't afford a new one. You see, there's a time and place for everything, but not in this movie. Because rap doesn't exactly fit in it. Honestly, none of the Tiffany songs fit in it. This movie is an unfocused mess. It doesn't know what its message wants to convey. It introduces characters that are just there and, let's face it, are completely useless. The movie feels rushed because they had to make time for Tiffany. 
And the worst part was, I was bored. I was not entertained. Sure, the plot could be messy. Sure, the animation could be bad. Sure, you have an unnecessary celebrity playing a role. But if I am not entertained, if I don't remember anything about it, if I am not having fun, then you failed as a movie. So the Jetsons movie is not on the best and worst list. It's midway. Why is that? Well, the movie itself was delayed due to the competition it had with the original release date. Something about mermaids and dogs going to heaven while on a future Christmas vacation part two. I don't know. So it opened on July 6th, 1990, along with Die Hard 2. Also, Total Recall, Deez of Thunder, Gremlins 2, Robocop 2 all came out the month before. It wasn't fighting with other cartoons and family films until Jungle Book was re-released by Disney a week later. So it was smack dab in the middle of the summer blockbuster season. That's probably what killed it. And now, let's make fun of Apollo Blue. Why am I here? Why am I here? Maybe I want to play darts with this girl. I'll pretend I care. Her parents aren't acknowledging me. I'm going to play darts with this girl. And hopefully the writers made me under the age of 18. As if that's any better. I wouldn't use Jetson if fishly sprockets were going bankrupt. If I needed a transfusion. If I lost my stockholders. My home. If I were penniless. He is expendable. Perfect. Do you know what the top 10 performing anime theatrical films released in the United States based off of an anime series are? They are number 10. Cowboy Bebop knocking on heaven's door. Number 9. Sword Art Online The Movie, Ordinal Scale. Number 8, Pokemon Forever. Number 7, Dragon Ball Z Battle of Gods. Number 6, Dragon Ball Z Resurrection F. Number 5, Digimon The Movie. Number 4, Pokemon 3 The Movie. Number 3, Yu-Gi-Oh! The Movie. Number 2, Pokemon The Movie 2000. And the number one performing anime theatrical film. I'm not going to say it again. It's Pokemon the first movie. Were you expecting something else? Right, right, right. Let's get back to the countdown. Helen took my day with Cosmo. And now my heart is totally broken. <laughs> I'll never be happy again. Never, 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 never. I hate this place. And the number five best performing movie is... Beavis and Butthead Do America. My word, where do I start with this movie? Let's start with, it's stupid. It's so stupid that it should not work, but its execution is so brilliant. If there was anything to compare it to, it would have to be Forrest Gump. The way Forrest just walks into one circumstance after another with very little motivation other than he's just there. Replace Forrest with Beavis and Butthead and you have Beavis and Butthead do America. It's just a long adventure where the two main characters just walk into each situation without knowing what the heck is going on with only two goals in mind. Watching TV and scoring with a chick. Like I said, it's brilliant. Now the character animation is pretty much the same from the series. However, the background is an improvement with a lot more detailing for the big screen. I guess I really should have given that credit to Recess Schools Out. The animation was the same, but they did a little bit more with shadow and light in the detailing. Now let's talk about the celebrities that are in Beavis and Butthead to America. We have Bruce Willis, Demi Moore, Robert Stack, and Cloris Leachman. Wait a minute! I've already talked about movies in this countdown that had all of these celebrities except for Demi Moore. Bruce Willis, Robert Stack, and Cloris Leachman were all in movies I've talked about. What are the odds? The celebrity voices are fine, but my favorite is Cloris Leachman as the... <sighs> Slut from the plane and the tour bus. There goes my advertiser friendly rating. As always, Mike Judge does a wonderful job with the multiple voices ranging from Beavis and Butthead, Tom Anderson, Principal McVicker, and the one that's designed to be hated. This is probably my favorite road movie next to the Vacation series. Ho <laughs> ho! 
Nice try. That is not canon. To be honest, I haven't watched that much of the Beavis and Butthead series because I get bored whenever I watch it. The series itself is fine, it's the music videos that had me changing the channel. Also, I didn't see the movie until the summer of 1997, and by then I was really into King of the Hill, so I was more into Hank Hill than I was Beavis and Butthead. It's still a great movie though, even if you have never seen the series. I'm also glad they stopped the music video thing with the Beavis and Butthead spinoff series, Daria. Now let's see what this movie was up against. Well first, Beavis and Butthead Do America was the biggest December box office opening in history at the time. That is not a bad start. Yeah, sure, others have passed that achievement after 1996, but that's still impressive. Probably the most notable movie that came out with it is Scream. <laughs> ah, scary jump scare. And the week after that, Mars Attack, Jerry Maguire and the Preacher's Wife. Ah, <laughs> Jerry jump scare. So you mean to tell me that Beavis and Butthead beat out Jerry Maguire in Scream for the number one opening in December? That is hilarious. Ha ha ha. Mary jump scare. Whoa. <clears throat> hey, buddy, this chick is pretty cool. She says there's gonna be tons of sluts in Las Vegas. Cool. <clears throat> it's so nice to meet young men who are so well mannered. So that's our video. If you liked it, please hit the like and subscribe button. Also, ring that bell for any future videos that I publish. You can find me on Facebook under Tunamp Art and Entertainment. Find me on Twitter under Tunamp Reviews. Find me on Tumblr and DeviantArt under Tunamp. Or support me on Patreon under Tunamp. Whoa. <laughs> hey, baby. I noticed you have braces. I have braces, too. <laughs> that was cool.